This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. That wonderful TV year, 1988. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. I've collected TV Guide Fall preview issues over the years and thought it would be fun to talk about which shows made it, which didn't, and which ones we actually watched. Now, I do have to give credit to Ken Reed's TV Guidance Counselor podcast for this idea. 1988's fall schedule is is the first to include a fourth network, Fox, which at that point was broadcasting only on the weekends. They wisely chose to avoid running new shows against the fall TV tumult. There was also a writer's strike that fall, which created both delays and opportunities. But let's start on Saturday night. Murphy's Law, ABC, George Siegel, stars as an alcoholic insurance fraud investigator living with potential girlfriend-slash-model Maggie Hahn, based on a series of detective novels. The dramedy ran all of 13 episodes, one of which didn't air. There's also an unrelated UK series of the same name from the 2000s. Dirty Dancing on CBS is the latest of a long tradition, TV shows based on films. In this case, the 1987 hit film, but with none of the film's cast. Patrick Cassidy steps into Patrick Swayze's shoes, while Melora Hardin takes over Jennifer Grey's role. McLean Stevenson and Paul Feig also star. The series continued the conceit that Baby was going to college after a summer at the resort. So how would this series have continued long term? As it turned out, that never became an issue. As you would expect, there are a lot of musical numbers sprinkled throughout the 11-episode run. Raising Miranda, CBS, James Naughton stars as a single father to an eponymous daughter played by Royana Black after the mom abandons them to find herself. He's not a great homemaker and wackiness ensues. Rihanna Black was better known for her child stage roles, and CBS must have considered her to be the next big thing, Mm -hmm. but that didn't pan out. The series is also the first regular TV role for Brian Cranston, who plays Naughton's brother-in-law. The show lasted all of nine episodes, two of which never aired. The ABC Saturday mystery movie, Get Out Your Flashlights, for an update of the classic 70s NBC series, complete with one of its stars, Peter Falk as Columbo. In a rotating series of TV movies, he's joined by... Burt Reynolds as B.L. Stryker, 12 episodes. Louis Gossett Jr. as Gideon Oliver for 5 episodes. Jacqueline Smith as Christine Cromwell, 4 episodes. And Telly Savalas returning as Kojak for 5 episodes. The series didn't actually get on the air until early 1989 due to the writer's strike, and then ran through May of 1990. Falk would continue doing a series of movies until 2003. Empty Nest, NBC. Soap's Richard Mulligan returns to TV alongside family's Christy McNichol in a spinoff of The Golden Girls. Mulligan plays a widower and pediatrician with two adult daughters, played by McNichol and Dinah Madoff, who move in with him. He also has to deal with a wisecracking nurse, played by Park Overall. The show ran seven seasons, a huge hit for NBC, and the cast did change over time. McNichol left the series, replaced by a younger sister, played by Lisa Rifle, who until then was only referenced. Mulligan's character retired, then began working for an inner-city medical clinic run by Marsha Warfield. Estelle Getty, ex-Golden Girl, became a recurring character. There was actually an earlier backdoor pilot on the Golden Girls with a different cast, which never took off until it was recast down the line. Empty Nest would later generate its own spin-off, Nurses. Mulligan would win an Emmy for the series. Moving on to Sunday night, Incredible Sunday, ABC. An attempt to resurrect That's Incredible, a series from the 80s and considered one of the first reality shows. Real people, no, that's the other 80s show, would be seen doing, well, incredible things. John Davidson was brought back from the original to host alongside Christine Ferreira and Tracy Gold. It lasted all of 16 episodes, not too incredible. The Magical World of Disney on NBC, speaking of remakes, after multiple incarnations going back to 1954, The long-running anthology series returned to NBC. Michael Eisner, Disney's chairman, served as host and Walt Standen. The series would run for two years, then move to cable, with only occasional specials on broadcast TV until Disney bought ABC in 1997. Mission Impossible, ABC, yet another remake, created in this case due to the writer's strike. 
With a lack of new scripts for shows, you either had to have stockpiled scripts in advance or go without. ABC decided to take classic scripts from the original 60s series and remake them with a mostly new cast and minor cosmetic changes. Peter Grace returned as Jim Phelps, now leading a team of younger operatives. Phil Morris played Grant, the son of Barney Collier, the electronics expert, and also the real-life son of Greg Morris, who played Barney. Thal Penglis stepped in as the disguise expert, Anthony Hamilton as the strongman, and Terry Markwell, later Jane Badwell, as the seductress. The show was shot in Australia to save money, and so there were a lot of Aussie accents. Once the strike ended, they began using original storylines. The series ran for two seasons, and might have run longer, if ABC had not moved it from Sunday into the middle of Thursday night's NBC Must See TV. Mm. On Monday night, we had the premiere of Murphy Brown on CBS. Candace Bergen switched from film to TV, playing a hard-nosed, recovering alcoholic at news magazine show FYI. She's sharp-tongued and does not suffer fools gladly. Murphy is joined at the news desk by stuffy Jim Dial, Charles Kimbrough, investigative reporter Frank Fontana, Joe Regabuto, and perky, quirky Sherwood, Faith Ford. They all supposedly work for executive producer Miles Silverberg, Grant Schott, although they normally just intimidate him. Murphy also has to deal with philosophical house painter Eldon, Robert Pastorelli, who slowly worked on her home for six seasons. The gang would hang out at Phil's bar run by Pat Corley. An ongoing gag on the series involved an ever-revolving series of secretaries for Murphy who would rarely last more than a day or two. After Miles and Corky eloped, then thought better of it, Miles moved on and was replaced by Kay Carter Shepley, Lily Tomlin, as the new exec. The show's apex occurred when Murphy had a child as a single mother, which became the subject of a real-world political attack by then-VP Dan Quayle. The show turned the tables and attacked Quayle the next season. The show's ratings temporarily boomed, and Quayle's political career went into a tailspin. The original series would run for ten seasons. CBS recently attempted to resurrect Murphy Brown in the current political maelstrom. With most of the cast returning, Kimbrough and Corley had passed away. But the writing was just too much on the nose and not very funny. Almost Grown, CBS, Tim Daly and Eve Gordon star in this drama as a couple uh, through three decades of their lives. Marsha Cross and Anita Gillette also star. The series was exec produced by David Chase, who had previously produced The Rockford Files and would go on to Northern Exposure and The Sopranos. Almost Grown was more of a speed bump. It mm -hmm. lasted 13 episodes, four of which never aired. On Tuesday, TV 101, CBS. Recently divorced photojournalist Sam Robarts quits his job and goes back to his high school so he can teach a journalism class how to make a TV news program rather than a school newspaper. So, welcome back, Cotter meets Lou Grant. The kids include future stars Stacey Dash, Terry Polo, and Matt LeBlanc. Another kid was Matt Dearborn, who went on to create Disney shows. The show ran into two issues. It was scheduled opposite Who's the Boss, Roseanne, and Matlock. And then one of the kids was pregnant in the storyline and had an abortion, which lost the show many of its sponsors. Mm -hmm. The result was 17 episodes total, four of which never aired. And speaking of its competition... Roseanne on ABC! Part of the era when TV networks were throwing shows at stand-up comedians. The controversial Roseanne starred as a working mom in a lower middle class family. Future movie stars John Goodman and Laurie Metcalf play husband Dan and sister Jackie, respectively. Michael Fishman plays son DJ, Sarah Gilbert plays younger daughter Darlene, and Lucy Gorenson and Sarah Chalk play older daughter Becky on and off in a Darren-esque move. As Roseanne moves from job to job, the supporting cast changes, including a young George Clooney, Martin Mull, and Fred Willard. Future Big Bang Theory zillionaire Johnny Galecki plays Darlene's boyfriend. The show becomes more extreme over time, matching Roseanne's personal issues and mental state. Dan has a heart attack in season 8 and barely pulls through. Eventually, after many seasons of financial and emotional travails, the Connors win the lottery, which forms the major final season storyline. This is cut off at the finale, where we learn the entire series is a story written by Roseanne's character. There was no lottery, and Dan actually died. The series was a huge hit for ABC in the top five shows for seven years, number one in 1989, and in the top 20 for two more. Metcalf would win three Emmys for the show and Roseanne won. Despite all this, or perhaps due to off-screen dramas, ABC walked away from a spin-off series with Roseanne only. Then, after years of rumors, the show returned last year with initial blockbuster ratings. 
And then Roseanne made racist statements online. This must have reminded ABC about how she would act, and the show was canceled. It was then resurrected as the Connors sans Roseanne. Personally, I was never a fan of the show. I watch TV to get away from the real world. Midnight Caller on NBC. Gary Cole stars as an alcoholic. Do I sense a pattern here? Cop who quits the force after accidentally shooting his partner. He then gets an offer to be an overnight radio host, becoming a detective to the callers and their issues. The offer comes from the Comely radio station owner, played by Wendy Kilborn. There's a will-they-won't-they they vibe that is never resolved. Topics include capital punishment and child abuse. One episode involved a bisexual AIDS carrier who deliberately infected straight women. Even in the less woke 80s, this was very controversial and caused a number of protests. The series ran for three seasons and only left the air after the network moved it from its original time slot. The series won two Emmys, both for guest roles. Then on Wednesday, The Van Dyke Show, CBS TV legend Dick Van Dyke returns to TV in yet another sitcom. Now he's a former Broadway star and TV father to real-life son Barry, who runs a small regional theater. Dick decides to help out Barry, wackiness ensues. Dick Van Dyke always knew how to pick out talent, with future stars Maura Tierney, News Radio, ER, The Affair, and Carrie Lizer, creator of The New Adventures of Old Christine, along with TV's Grady, Whitman Mayo. Even with that talent, it never gelled, and the show was gone after ten episodes, three of which never aired. You could probably start an entire network based on discarded TV episodes. Mary Tyler Moore, a.k.a. Annie McGuire, on CBS. The network paired up Dick and Mary on the schedule, but neither series did well. When the TV Guide issue was published, Mary's new series didn't have its final name. Mary is now a politician, newly married to D Nick, Dennis Arndt, an engineer, both with kids from previous marriages. Annie's mom, Eileen Heckert, is ultra-liberal, and Nick's dad, John Randolph, is ultra-conservative. So, there's that. One of the kids is played by a young Adrian Brody. The TV Guide issue had Nick being played by Edward J. Moore, no relation, so it's clear there was last-minute tinkering. It didn't help. The show was gone in 11 episodes, three of which never aired. Baby Boom, NBC, another TV show based on a film, in this case the 1987 hit with Diane Keaton, now replaced by Kate Jackson, the former angel coming off of Scarecrow and Mrs. King. Three actors came over from the film, Sam Wanamaker as Kate's boss and Michelle and Christina Kennedy as her two-year-old daughter from a long history of using twins to play very young characters on TV. Can Kate be a high-powered exec and a good mom? Well, we didn't get much of a chance to find out mm -hmm. as the show was gone after 13 episodes, five of which never aired. Tattinger's on NBC. Meet Nick and Hillary Tattinger, Stephen Collins and Blythe Danner, a divorced couple and owners of a high-end New York restaurant. He's shot by a drug dealer and leaves for Paris, but is forced to return to save the family business. There's daughters, employees, one played by Jerry Stiller, and patrons involved, some of which were real New York celebrities doing cameos. Did I mention this was a 60-minute dramedy from the people who brought you Homicide and Touched by an Angel? <laughs> and it was at that point NBC's first drama to shoot in New York City since the 50s. The show was gone by January, but was quickly resurrected as a 30-minute sitcom called Nick and Hillary, which lasted all of two episodes. Moving to Thursday, Nightwatch ABC. Based partly on New York City's real-life guardian angels, this drama stars Benjamin Bratt in his first regular TV role as the leader of a group of organized vigilantes. Somehow, the local police didn't shut down this group before it was killed by its competition, Cosby, after nine episodes. Paradise on CBS. Another attempt to resurrect the TV Western, with Lee Horsley as a gunfighter forced to take care of four children after his sister dies. He starts farming in the eponymous town, but his violent past keeps coming up. He ends up protecting the town as an unofficial marshal. A special two-part episode reintroduced two 1950s TV cowboys, Gene Barry and Hugh O'Brien, creating their roles of Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp. The stunt saved the series from cancellation, which went on to run for three seasons. The final season was renamed Guns of Paradise, so just so you remembered it was a Western. The series was replaced with a more durable Western, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Dear John, NBC, Judd Hirsch returns to TV, a statement that would be made multiple times. As a man dumped by his wife after a 10-year marriage, he joins a support group called the One to One Club, populated with a group of neurotics, including Jerry Burns as a boorish man and Jane Carr as the sexually obsessed leader. The series was based on a UK show of the same name, 
and was highly rated when it was in the middle of NBC's must-see TV Thursday lineup. It rapidly dropped in the ratings once it left that catbird seat, and the series ended after four seasons. And we're to Friday. Something is out there on NBC. TV networks love to drop sci-fi series on Friday nights, assuming all the nerds will not be out partying. Probably not a bad thought. This one stars John Cortez as a police officer investing a series of brutal murders. It turns out an alien shapeshifter is the murderer, so alien doctor Miriam Dabo, a former Bond girl, partners with him to track it down. She has various superhuman abilities to meet the needs of the script. If it doesn't sound very open-ended, it was previously a two-part miniseries that then got six episodes as a weekly show, with two more never broadcast. So let's recap. In 1988, out of 21 new series, there were nine hits. ABC Saturday Mystery Movie, Empty Nest, Magical World of Disney, Mission Impossible, Murphy Brown, Roseanne, Midnight Caller, Paradise, Dear John, and 12 Misses. So 1988 really wasn't a great TV year. No. No. Well, you can go check out some of those reruns streaming online, or you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. <laughs>